Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Ernesto Vizcarra He was born and raised in Mexico City, Mexico, in a working class household. He went to public schools and received a chemical, metallurgical engineering degree from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where he worked as a professor for many years. He received a scholarship from that institution to carry out graduate studies at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He arrived in Boston in 1980 and received a PhD in metallurgy in 1985. He worked at MIT for two years until he was hired by Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute at the Harvard campus in 1987 and has been employed there since then. Currently, he is a professor of practice in mechanical engineering at the Institute. Lately, he volunteers for the docent at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, and he has been taking courses for Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And, uh, I appreciate the invitation, Mary and Marianne. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see uh, so many of you. A bit intimidating. Yeah. But mm -hmm. since I'm also a student here, uh, even though I'm an older student, so I feel kind of a collegial atmosphere in this group. Um, I was asked to come and say a, a few words about myself and my, my life. I, I, I'm in the twilight of my life, like you all young people, and maybe uh, some, some of, of what I say could be, give you some ideas and some pointers uh, about your own way of uh, strategizing for the future. I see a, 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 a nice uh, list of questions here. I don't know if you have seen this list of questions. I think that they are, they are good questions, and uh, we could work uh, based on that. Um, he, he, he effectively says, uh, briefly in a compact way, my, my situation. I was born and raised in Mexico City and came to America when I was already 25 years old. Uh, yeah, I am I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I, I, I didn't have to cross the river. I, I, I benefited from a scholarship from my university where I graduated and then worked for a number of years to come and do graduate study uh, here in America. And my goal was precisely that, right? to, to gain uh, additional uh, level of expertise in my discipline, which is the, uh, the study of metals. Uh, how to make them, how, how to use them, the prop study the properties of them. Uh, so I, well, in Boston, towards the end of my studies, I met my wife. So I got lucky in many ways. So I got my scholarship, then my wife here, and I got uh, this offer to come to Rensselaer Polytechnic, uh, the Hartford campus. I was attracted to that because it was a campus in which the students are all working people working graduate engineers, they work in industry, and they come to school to gain uh, a master's degree in engineering. So I have been there, uh, it's somewhat unusual, most people nowadays have three, four, five, ten jobs in their lifetime. <laughs> I have had that, that job for 35 years, so it's a kind of an unusual situation. And I'm still there, uh, I'm still teaching the, the graduate level mechanical engineering courses. And uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I received an email about uh, an opportunity to become a docent. Uh, a docent is uh, one of those that uh, show people work, selected works of art inside the museum and talk a little bit about what the art is. is, is. And I, I got uh, trained uh, together with my courses here at CCSU and the art, art department which were a, a, a fantastic, a, a fantastic way of uh, learning quickly many items of, uh, of the art world, which I was not aware of because I'm an engineer, so I, I work from the other side of the brain, <laughs> so I had to open the, the opposite side. Those courses at CCSU have been extremely useful to me, and uh, I, I have enjoyed uh, being, uh, coming here. I'm already on my fourth course here, so maybe at some point I transition from non-matriculated to matriculated, so sometimes it's so much fun. So, so are the courses are art? Yeah, they're, they're all art courses, so art history, uh, 
drawing uh, American art and contemporary art. So it's, it's really, it's been a, a very fun experience to, to do that. I have to come and coexist uh, with the uh, younger people, younger folks taking classes. Uh, it, it just kind of brings back memories of a uh, long time past. <laughs> So uh, I, I think the questions laid down here were the uh, personal questions. So we we could go over that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how these were drafted, but I think they were they're very good questions. If someone wants to read them, or uh, I can read them. I thought, uh, what would you suggest? Yeah, I suggest that, like you guys. Uh, uh, it'd be casual. Whoever wants, wants to ask a question, you want to come in. Uh, it would be nice if you could talk about your background, like coming from Mexico to the United States, like what you had to go through as a Latino too, so yeah, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, I, I was lucky, right, uh, in the sense that I got my education all the way through college in the public school system in Mexico, which is essentially open uh, to everyone, right? As long as you pass the examinations, they, they go through the system and there is no issue of uh, uh, fighting to get money in order to get it. Of course, my parents supported me completely. I, I live at home. I didn't, I, I, I didn't have the luxury. I wanted to live on my own, but I couldn't afford it economically. So my parents uh, supported me. Uh, my father provided the bus money <laughs> daily to go to the university, and I was able to get a, a, a college degree in metallurgy. And uh, afterwards, uh, there was a, an opportunity to receive a scholarship uh, uh, to uh, study abroad. And uh, a condition of getting accepted <coughs> in the uh, foreign university. So uh, that was a long process. It took uh, almost two years of preparing and uh, uh, doing examinations. They, for graduate school, as you might know, if you want to go to graduate school, you have to do some kind of examination, graduate uh, graduate record examination. Uh, in my discipline, so I had to do engineering. I had to do. Uh, an English uh, examination, the TOEFL, uh, for me, because I was not a uh, native speaker. Uh, once I was able to uh, successfully gain admission to the uh, institute, uh, the MIT, uh, then the, uh, the, pro the, uh, the process of uh, obtaining the scholarship was significantly facilitated. <laughs> I was able to come with my letter that I had been admitted to MIT, I had passed all the hurdles, and then the, uh, uh, my university <laughs> provided the support to uh, allow me to come to the state. So I came in, I, I, I had a girlfriend already in Mexico, so that split of my my culture, my, my friends, it, it was a, 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 a difficult thing, right, trying to adjust. I thought I was in a privileged situation because I came to one of the best schools in the world and uh, all the expenses paid. So, I mean, that, that's a fantastic thing. But the, 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 uh, the experience of being uprooted from my, my normal background, right, was, was a bit hard to assimilate. But it was counterbalanced by everything that was new coming to America. So there were so, so many new things that I never saw before that were, it made me uh, not to think so much about my, my uprooting uh, as a Latin. Um, I went through the, the whole five-year program to uh, and obtain a doctorate uh, over there. Then uh, I, I gained uh, a position for two years after my doctorate, a postdoctoral thing, which is what many times happens in graduate school, right? So you can go from doctor, it seems like never ending. You, you go to the master's, you go to the doctor, and then you keep going postdoctor until I, I saw an opportunity from a uh, professional journal from the colleges. I saw a little advertisement. Hartford Graduate Center at Celia Polytechnic is looking for a, 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 doctor, uh, a doctor in metallurgy to come and uh, uh, lead the metallurgy program within metallurgy. And I learned a little bit about it and I applied. I was called to a couple of interviews. Uh, I got to interview a bunch of people and then they offered me the job. Um, 
uh, when I, uh, I had met my wife just uh, about a year before that, and uh, when I came, uh, interesting, when I came to Hartford, she had a job in, in Boston, and uh, practically a week after we got married, we split. Because she stayed in Boston for a number of months to finish the job, and I came to Hartford to work. And I have uh, been there uh, uh, since then. In terms of uh, uh, going back to this uh, transition from being in a, a, a race, born and raised in Mexico, and then coming to the United States, there is the question here, uh, have you, did you face any discrimination because of your ethnicity? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, to some degree. Because people that thank you, you can tell from my accent that I, I don't, I'm not a native speaker, and that's like a stamp, right? That's a mark for uh, the moment you open your mouth, you give yourself. I had a, a friend, a former military uh, a man, uh, African American, a uh, neighbor of mine, that said, Hey, you, you look white. He said, You look white. Uh, uh, as long as you don't open your mouth, you will do fine in this country, uh, 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 implying that the appearance that I could do the trick. As long as I, uh, I didn't open my mouth or went through some kind of a speech correction, <laughs> uh, training. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, open discrimination, uh, I will say maybe in part because I look white, somewhat white perhaps, not as ruthless as some other people are, 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 are discriminated upon. But then I, I, I do uh, I remember many incidents where I was kind of slighted or, or not, not treated uh, the way a civilized man, let's say, right? the way a civilized people. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, so I had a question. Um, based on like your engineer background, what's some of the like, more interesting things that you've learned in school? Well, uh, well I, I came with the goal of uh, becoming, uh, uh, trying to become an expert on uh, the use of uh, mathematical models and, uh, and computer simulation. To, to, uh, to, to understand metallurgical processes, right, like casting or forging, the type of operations that are used in practice to create metal objects, right? And uh, so I would say the, the mathematics, right, and the use of computers, when I came in, computers were not as common as, as we have them now. Uh, so the, uh, becoming immersed in the world of, of mathematics, advanced mathematics, the kind of mathematics that you need in order to uh, uh, tackle uh, complex problems in, in engineering, <laughs> uh, and uh, the use of computers uh, to do uh, that, uh, were quite important uh, to, to me personally to develop that, that expertise. Uh, and of course, I, the reason that drove me to MIT was uh, a very famous professor that was there, that uh, was my mentor and my advisor, and uh, he was uh, essentially uh, an expert on that area of mathematics, applying mathematics and computers to the representation of uh, uh, metallurgical systems. Uh, nowadays, uh, over, after 30 something years of that, uh, the use of mathematical models and computer simulation, the same way that we see them on phones and everywhere, right? Computers are everywhere, uh, are becoming uh, extremely important in industrial practice. So if you go and work for Procter Whitney or General Dynamics or Radeon or whatever, so it's more likely than not that you're going to have to. Uh, be working with computers and with uh, simulation models, right? Because there is uh, a great advantage of doing that, uh, in particular in systems that are uh, hard to work with, like metals, molten metal. You think of molten metal and casting with high temperature, very uncomfortable environment. And you can simulate those kinds of things in the computer 
and get ideas of how this, the actual system really works, and that's helpful in design, in operation, optimizing. Why did you become interested in um, metals? And working with metals, or when you were an undergrad? Yeah, I, I was an undergrad, right? And uh, I had, after high school, uh, we are expected to choose a college major, right? the system in Mexico. Okay? So if you went to this particular high school, you get a certain set of courses that prepare you for uh, chemistry or mathematics or physics, right? The different high schools have slightly different emphasis. Other schools more into maybe social sciences or art. But there's, the high school I went had more of an emphasis on the on the, the hard sciences, right? And my chemistry is systematic. And then from there I went to the school of chemistry, which were, uh, was where the, the, the Department of Metallurgy was located. Uh, I didn't know much about the metal or metallurgy at the time, but I I discovered that when I went into chemistry, the first year you take common courses with all the other people that are doing chemistry, organic chemistry, uh, all kinds of chemistry, chemical engineering. And uh, I, while I, I was doing that, I discovered that the uh, metallurgy program. And, uh, I, it just fascinated me, the, the idea that, uh, I, I don't know, I find it fascinating, many people just may not comprehend why it is interesting, but the, the, the idea of taking a piece of metal or, or a rock, let's say, and then stripping from the rock the metal, and then taking the metal, heating it, heating it until it melts, and then handling it as if it were water in order to produce a cast of the like a sculpture or actual objects uh, used in engineering applications. I essentially became interested at a very early age, so maybe about 18 years old. So I know you mentioned that you face like a big culture shock when you came to the United States mm -hmm. from Mexico. What are some of the ways that you kind of dealt with that experience? Well, it's interesting because we're in the classroom, right? I I, re I think I received a fairly good education at the university in Mexico. Well, the chemistry school was uh, top notch. So when I came in, I came to MIT. I was a bit intimidated because I knew MIT was a, it's a tough school and has the, all this reputation. And I, I was a bit apprehensive. But uh, when I started going to uh, classroom lectures and all that, I discovered that it, it was fairly, it, that I could navigate it fairly well. And I felt comfortable, I felt confident that I could do it. So I, I will listen to the lectures, uh, I, I will read, uh, I will do my homework. I was I, I've always been a bit obsessive about uh, it's cool work, right? So that's, I mean, everyone has its own defects, right? So I think that's my. And uh, I discovered that the, uh, the classroom experience was, was very manageable for me. But what shook me deeply is one day, uh, near the beginning of my stay in Boston, I came out of the, uh, of the school, and I was going to take a bus to go somewhere, right, in Cambridge. And I go, and uh, I didn't know the bus routes or any of that. So I, the bus stops, I asked the bus driver if he was going to go to a certain place, right? I was going, I don't remember where I was going, but said, do you go by a certain place? He looks at me and responds something that I understood absolutely nothing. <laughs> he responded in this Bostonian, uh, Bostonian uh, uh, dialect, right? <laughs> I couldn't understand anything, and, and he repeated to me, and, and I couldn't figure it out. I tried to explain to him what I was doing. Eventually, I didn't even jump on the bus, because I, I couldn't figure out what I was going on. So, the, 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 and this issue is still, in some ways, uh, I encounter it uh, uh, sometimes, but uh, obviously at the beginning, these uh, street conversations with people uh, were uh, fairly intimidating, which uh, was shocking because uh, in the classroom I was doing reasonably well. Of course, I had the benefit of textbooks and notes and written stuff on the blackboard and all that, so that was manageable. But I was 
speaking, right? Hearing people speaking in the street and uh, telling me, oh, there is a... Uh, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't get that. Uh, and that, uh, that was a, a, hard, a hard experience, and a silly, <laughs> I must admit. Um, when you were in school, was there ever a time where you were like, questioning what you were studying? When I was... Uh, when, was the, where, when you were studying, were, did you ever think of going another route? Or yes. Did you? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, especially uh, you, you, in the graduate program, you're supposed to do regular progress, right? And, uh, uh, and you, uh, at the same time, you are pretty much left to your own. Your, your supervisor, your advisor, your mentor is there to guide you, but he has a, another half a dozen students that he has to guide. So, you, in my experience over there, you were very much expected to do your thing, right? And to do it right, and to come up to your uh, supervisor with everything that can be um, And uh, I remember in, uh, a, a, remember I had a scholarship, right? So I had been already two years uh, here at MIT working on a particular research project. And uh, I, I was not, I felt that I was not making the progress that I I needed to make, or that I felt that I needed to make. Um, uh, in 1982, uh, there was an economic catastrophe in, in, in Mexico, which, which is the source of my funding. So the, 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 all of a sudden I get a letter from uh, my, the organization that was funding, my, sponsoring my study, and I said, well, sorry, but now we are we have to clear up all this situation that we have here, and there's going to be some uh, uh, some delay in your, uh, in your allowance uh, and in the uh, the provision of the scholarship. Uh, and I remember one day uh, walking right next to the river by myself and thinking, this, this is uh, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm here. I made the progress I want to make. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the money seems to be drying up. Uh, I'm a total failure. Right? What am I going to do? I'm going to go back to Mexico, no degree, nothing after two years of receiving support. And it, 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 was, uh, it was very traumatic uh, to feel that you may not be cutting it. <laughs> you may not be uh, the, the right, you may not have the right stuff to, 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 to do what needs to be done. It's definitely shocking. Uh, I mean, this situation of the scholarship lasted for a few months. My supervisor and the institute in particular was, was very supportive. So when I had the money, they said, well, we lend you some money so that you can survive. Uh, and that support was uh, very important uh, because uh, with that, I, I was able to settle down and say, well, I, I get all these benefits, all this support from all sides, so I, I better make sure that I get the right thing. Uh, and I eventually, it worked, right? So I ended up getting my degree. In fact, my supervisor asked me to, uh, and normally uh, you are asked to complete a master's degree and then a PhD. My supervisor was happy enough with what I had done for research for the master's, I said, don't, don't bother writing a master's thesis. It will just, it will take time away from you. You better keep going directly to the doctor. So I, I'm one of those uh, somewhat strange beings that has a doctorate that doesn't have a master's thesis. Oh. Mm. So you kept on working on the, on the same project? In a, a variation of the same project, right? So, and then I, I essentially was able to complete it successfully with the, with the conditions of the but, but it, yeah, those, those humps on the road, those bumps on the road are, are definitely there, uh, were there, and it's not the only time. The, the self-doubt is a big thing. Uh, you're not sure if you're made for it. And, uh, just, uh, all I did was keep pushing, right? So try to not give up and keep pushing. And in terms of changing, uh, in, in 
reason I, uh, I went into engineering, uh, coming from a, uh, my family, which was working class, uh, there was some kind of push to go into something that could generate some money, <laughs> could, be, could be economically profitable. In high school, I, I, I expressed some interest in going into, into art or going into theater or going into something like that. An uncle of mine uh, said, you're never going to make any, any good living out of that. Uh, you, you, you're good at math, you're good at today, you took a good behavior when I was in school. But you're good at math, you're good at this, why would you uh, waste your, your, your intelligence right? going into that? I said, well, I like it. Well, you like it, but it, it's not, it you're not going to make any money and you need money because this is you. you if your family is, is not a wealthy family, right? You got a wealthy family, so you do whatever you want. But if you have a family that may at some point depend on you to some degree, then you better do it. And it actually worked out that way because I started working here. And so they make good, make good money. And then I can play and make good money. And, so and, uh, I, and I was able to help my parents uh, throughout uh, over many years. We from we parents in Mexico, me from here. I was able to uh, assist them in, in many, many ways. Uh, uh, Standing not significant, but I was able to help uh, their lifestyle in, in Mexico be much more comfortable. Thanks to my situation here in the state. Did you speak art? Or the internet, like, as a hobby, on the side? I, I, I did. I did. Yeah. I, I always, uh, since I was a little kid, I used to do a lot of drawing. I, I, I was uh, uh, an only child for about five years, so all my, when I was little, I was almost alone most of the time. And I, I, I took it to drawing a lot. Then I didn't do it much, I just did it on the side. But now that I'm more uh, getting more into art, I'm doing more and more drawing, drawing and maybe even using color for painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, based on your experiences, like in the university system here in the United States, what do you think are some ways that universities can better support first-generation minority students? Uh, I think I'm very concerned about the, the issue of the cost of, of, the, of going to university. I find it coming from my own experience in Mexico, where education was free. And even MIT, which was a fairly expensive private school, but I got the scholarship. So I, I got the benefit of a freebie, practically a freebie. Uh, I cannot really, it's hard for me to understand the situation of many students nowadays that they have to do all kinds of, uh, 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 all kinds of efforts, right, to, to be able to afford the education. I think the uh, finding ways to uh, secure uh, uh, funding for, uh, for your education, uh, it, it, it's not easy, right? I mean, in my own personal situation, uh, to get the scholarship, it, it was a long process. It took like two years from the moment I started doing that until I got it, uh, but eventually got it. So I, I know it's, it's quite difficult to, to get the resources and support for that, but I will encourage everyone to really pursue all possible ways and try to avoid getting into this situation where you owe a lot of money and, and it just doesn't let you sleep well you are uh, uh, you are in debt for for thousands of dollars over the last two years so i think that's a, to me that that would be a, a it's a challenging situation here for young people like you like all of you in in the states that education is involves such a such an expense the way it is, and uh, fortunately, there are ways out there which is, is they are difficult because the money is is not readily available. Right, but there are some ways, and I will encourage everyone to seek ways. So wherever you can find ways where you can get some support, 
to go to school to help you pay for your education. Like you stand well spent. Do you think um, <coughs> diversity in the school system impacts students? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I said, um, do you think um, diversity in the school system impacts students? Uh, you, you're wondering if the, the characteristics of the school system impact students? Is the is? diversity. Oh, the diversity <clears throat> issue. Um, see that the diversity issue, uh, when I was uh, going through college in, in Mexico, uh, the society in Mexico uh, is in many ways much more homogeneous. I, I mean, I, I kind of look a bit odd because I'm a little wider than most Mexicans. If you think of people that you know from Mexico, people tend to be darker complexion. Yeah. And uh, in, the, in going to the university, it's a more homogeneous group, even in terms of gender. There were quite a few women in the chemistry school, which is regarded as a top school. There were quite a few uh, women in the school studying chemistry. Most of them, interested, uh, interestingly, studying bio, biochemistry, I right? think related to biology, for whatever reason. Right? The, the, chem, the chemical engineers were mostly men, right? but the biochemistry were mostly females. So the uh, uh, diversity never occurred to me as an issue going through college. Um, I think the diversity uh, has been getting more and more and more in the last, I don't know, decade, maybe the last 10 years. Uh, although it was clear when I went to MIT, uh, the, uh, my classrooms were uh, heavily biased male, for sure. And uh, right now, you go to MIT, and many classrooms are half and half. So it's, it's really as the, the institute has. Arrangements. Uh, I uh, I'm taking classes here and here in the art department. Uh, uh, I'm often the only male in the in the classroom, right? So it's uh, it, it, I don't know if it's just because it's the art department, but it, it's a uh, more biased <coughs> theme and, and people with other sexual orientation. Uh, I think diversity. I mean, how can you go wrong with diversity? Diversity is the spice of life, right? That, that's what brings the most interesting uh, aspects of humanity to have people with all kinds of <coughs> minds and ideas and opinions. Uh, a, 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 in many ways, these societies with a uniform mindset are extremely boring, I think. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Any other questions? How about your experience uh, uh, as a student at CCSU? I can try to connect there. So I came from Brazil like six, seven, almost eight years ago. So coming from Brazil, then living in Hartford, and like, I, you're from Hartford, right? So you know how diverse everything okay. is. So like, I knew my own people were there. Like there was a lot of Brazilians, Puerto Ricans, Spanish. Uh, so then my parents moved to Burlington, and like the in Vermont or in Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut. Okay. So the experience there it was much more different than living harder when you see people like you. So going there and then like. Leaving the uh, public schools in Hartford, going to a Madeline school, and now here in our CCSU, kind of like the, like she asked about the diversity, is very like, in a way, it had impacted me. Because sometimes, like, when I, I'm around people that I feel comfortable with, that after that, can, they can relate to me, I can kind of like talk and feel around and even have more like mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. But when I feel like I'm like the minority in the room, I kind of like, take to myself and all that. So for me, diversity is something that is impacts me a lot, my performance. I, I understand completely. Yeah, yeah, and I can see your feelings of being in a room 
she to yes. this day, I'm much older than you, uh, sitting in a room, uh, I learned to deal with that, uh, uh, sitting in a room surrounded by uh, people of Anglo-Saxon extraction only, uh, it's, uh, it, it makes me reflect you know, on the situation. I, I sense it. I, I, I can <coughs> deal with it because I learn already. But, it, uh, but it, it, I get the sense. Uh, curiously enough, uh, in a situation in a, a room for of people of uh, people of color, uh, African Americans or people of color, I don't feel the same level. Of, which is kind of interesting. Although I, I learned to, I had to learn to deal with all kinds of people because that's America, right? America is all kinds of people. If you don't know how to deal with other people, then you're going to have a very hard time. It's, it's, it's important. And you all got to, you have no choice, but you're going to have to uh, adapt to it and, and, and take it as a, a normal everyday thing. And, that, and that's how I take it. I mean, to, to me, it, it's just uh, I, it's a different feeling, like having with different groups of people. But it's still, it's something that is is very, it's something that is very manageable for me. That I can I can interact. I can have uh, a connection to people. Like that. From Brazil. There must be enough Brazilian students here, right? Here? Here. Is here? I mean, Dr. Yeah. Mohani says she met someone I haven't met any. Yeah. You have yeah, there are some. Yeah. There are there are Brazilian students here. Yeah, oh, they, yeah. they should be, right? Yeah, yeah there are. Be. There perhaps aren't as many as we would like, but there are. Mm -hmm. There are quite a. There are quite a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the issue, particularly given the economic conditions of people of color, uh, it's very important to bring everyone on board. And, uh, it, 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 the, otherwise, the society is divided into groups of, of people that are uh, regarded as disposable, right? and they want, the other ones that run the show. Right? And we all want to be running the show. Right? We don't want to be told you know, how the show should be run, but we, we want to have a say. Uh, right? Do you have a message for the students that they will not come out with their undergrad program? Uh, I think uh, it seems like a cliche, but I think hard work is it, 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 uh, often. A, a key, right? Uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice uh, uh, things that you would like to do, or things that uh, you say, "Well, I, I really would like to do this," right? But um, the risk of doing that is that you may fall short in something that may, in the long run, may be more important to your life later. On. It's a judgment call, right? Sometimes those. Those things that you don't do because you are doing homework or because you are studying uh, are missed opportunities, right? And there is an opportunity cost, right? So mm -hmm. it, 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 a balance, uh, I think, is important, right? Try to try to juggle like a juggler, right? I see much uh, uh, my uh, uh, my life is very much of a juggler, especially now that I'm taking courses. And, Art and adoption at the museum. I'm still working at Rensselaer. Uh, I have a, I have a bunch of cats in my house, so uh, I, I had to try to keep everything going and right? keep my wife happy too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We spent some time trying to keep your wife happy, also. <laughs> <laughs> um, his wife teaches you. Yeah, she's an anthropology. Too. I have a feeling some of their some of the people here are probably her students. Probably yeah. not. No. Dr. Jamil Gutierrez. No. Oh, okay. Any last questions? Uh, I just have one last question, which would be like, how important do you think it is for people to get college degrees? That's a fantastic question. It's really, it's particularly in the current situation that we live in. Uh, when you think about all the 
sometimes that is needed for someone to get to the point where they can go and practice at a high level of profession, an engineer or a brand artist. You need at least 18 years. And when you think about all the courses, I must have taken hundreds of courses and all kinds of things. Uh, how many of those courses? Uh, I cannot tell that all of those courses were important to my intellectual nature. And probably many of them were mm -hmm. useless uh, in many ways. So this determining uh, what is the right complexion of knowledge and, 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 and training or education that you should go to uh, is determined by the, by the environment, right? You come to CCSU, you want to be an engineer, you have to follow the curriculum, right? There is a curriculum, you have to take this course, you have to take this course, you have to pass all the, all the courses and get your degree. Uh, but uh, what good is going through that experience if, uh, if when it comes time for you to make a living, you have a difficulty finding a job or, or you get a job that is totally, makes you completely unhappy. Uh, so those are really difficult things, right? Why do you spend all this time going through a, 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 a process that puts you in a situation that you're uncomfortable? Uh, yet, uh, I, if I had the opportunity to do it again, I think I will do it again, <laughs> right? Because I had very good memories of my College years, right, going to school, chemistry, sedimentary, excellent experience going to MIT. So those, those experiences alone, even separate from what happened afterwards, right? They just the fact of being in a university environment and, and interacting with people, young people like all of you, right? That, that, that's a fantastic experience. It's a socializing experience and it exposes you to all kinds of ideas and and things that if you weren't going, if you wouldn't do that, you wouldn't have them. Right? So the university, in many ways, the college, it has that uh, atmosphere of, uh, of uh, ideas that, that you're exposed to. That it, it would be very difficult to find in any other environment. It, it, you could probably do nowadays, maybe uh, if you. Uh, train yourself as a plumber or as a welder or something like that. You could be making a very good living, have a nice house in the suburbs and a good automobile. You could probably do that, especially here in America. Many other places you cannot do that. You could do it here. But then you will miss that intellectual uh, environment. So that the university. I, I, I think the, the university is a very unique place. And uh, just the experience of going through it, uh, I think, is valuable. The main issue is uh, that I see here in the state is, is the cost associated with it. And the, it's just uh, if you go through the route of uh, depending on loans to do that, you end up with a lack of rolling chain. Right? And that is, I think, that's not a nice situation. Yeah, my, my wife was living in Boston. She was working there at the time. She was a nurse. She had been, uh, she uh, was, uh, went to Boston College and got a nursing degree. And uh, she was uh, a working nurse in a, in a clinic in Boston. And we met by accident in, in one of the, those. Most likely that's how you end up meeting your significant other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Just like that. laughs> So uh, mm -hmm. it, we, we, we both attended that talk, and uh, the rest was history. How long did it take before she came to Hartford with you? Uh, I, I, I came to uh, Boston in 85, 1980, 1980. And I came to Hartford in, in 1987. I spent seven years in the Boston area. And my wife had been there in Boston because she graduated from Boston College. She had been there like double the time. She spent like 15 years in Boston. Thank you. So I think what the student was asking, Dr. Gutierrez, is how did you manage 
right? A family and relationship in which. Um, but when she was left. When behind. she was still in Boston and you were still in Hartford. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, yeah, there was, a, <laughs> there was an interesting thing uh, that we, uh, instead of going on a honeymoon, uh, we split. Uh, just a few days after we got married, we split. Uh, and she stayed there for a good, at least three or four months in, in Boston. Well, I came here. Uh, it, it was hard, but it's not, not uh, totally a disaster because we had been living together in sin before, right? So we, we met uh, in 84, right? Towards the end of 84, we lived together for about three years. So it's not like we just met and then we split. It's, we had been living together already. And we, uh, uh, I think we came to the agreement of the split. It was because of logistics. I mean, she didn't want to just immediately quit her job. She wanted to keep and at least complete what she needed, what she was doing. And I, I was hired and I had to come uh, and take the position uh, at the time. So, and, and the, coming uh, and starting a new job, you are all charged and ready to go. So I didn't have much time to, to think about the, the split, right? I was so focused on the work that I it really, I didn't even feel it. I, it, was, it was just a few or four months later, she came in and then there we go. So it's fantastic. Any other um, if you don't mind me asking, what is your American dream? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I actually had an American dream. Actually, let me tell you, I spent, uh, I'm 68 now. I got my naturalization citizenship, U.S. citizenship, just last May. So most of my life I was living with a green card, right? Living green card. Uh, in a way, I, I, I never thought of it much, but going through the process of naturalization and becoming an American citizen, in a way, it, 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 it's a dream. <laughs> I never thought, I never thought of it. I thought it wouldn't make any difference, right? But it, it really uh, made me reflect about what it is uh, being an American. How long did it take? Oh, so I, I started because of COVID, they had all kinds of delays or whatever. It took almost a year from the moment I applied to the moment I got the interview. I, I took a, a course, a citizenship course, right? We went through the whole thing. So it was a, it was a very interesting experience. And I, uh, I, I definitely appreciate it. it, it grow, uh, I develop a growing appreciation of what it is to be an Even though I have lived here most of my life in America, right? I didn't feel as American before mm -hmm. as when I became a, a citizen, which is kind of crazy because it's, it's the same person, everything is the same. Of course, from a ceremonial point of view, for the bureaucratic point of view, now I have my passport, American passport. It, it's a difference, right? It's, I, I don't have a green card, now I have an American passport. And it, it does psychologically do, does something to you. <laughs> kind of deal with um, the U.S. Um, citizenship, so I kind of train people so I know the process. You know the process. Mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's not a trivial process, and you have to do it right. <laughs> yeah, I knew someone that it took them a year and a half to you know, get it because of COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm preparing for it. I, I took it when I took those classes. Many of my classmates in the class is very anxious, right? It, it's tough. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Some people don't speak English uh, at all, very little English, and the consequences of the process. So it's, a, it's a challenge. And some of them get failed, uh, failed fail interview, go to the interview, and they give the wrong answer to something. I, I think you give two or three wrong answers, and they send you back to. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's stressful. Right. It's a bit difficult, and I was a bit anxious right. to be going for it. Uh, but uh, interestingly, my interview lasted 10 minutes. 
when I went to the interview. So, Dr. Gutierrez, I'm thinking many of the students don't understand the process for getting. So, Naturally you, you don't just come to the United States and apply to become a citizen. You have to uh, go through. So, Dr. Gutierrez had what's called a green card, which is work authorization, right. during residential work for what 60 years. Oh, I, I had that green card for about 30 years, yeah. right? a little over so 30 years, 32 years. Yeah. That gives you the ability to be here, but it doesn't make you a citizen. So when Correct. you, right, and... Yeah, you cannot vote, and you cannot be part of a jury. So those yeah. two things, uh, you're two choosers with a green card. And, uh, and that's, that's the biggest difference from a bureaucratic standpoint, that when you become a citizen, you are entitled right. to vote right. and to be part of a, a, a jury of your peers. And it is very, very challenging to obtain a green card. It is very, very difficult. And before the work green card, what did you do for the student to be able to study? No, when 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 you come as a student and everything is uh, 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 correct, uh, you are uh, you are granted a, a visa called F1 visa, which is a student visa. It's essentially a student visa. You cannot work. You you cannot do go to another school. You have to stay in the school where you came. And you stay on that visa until you graduate. After you graduate, then you could conceivably get an extension of that visa. And that's what I did when I worked at that postdoctoral association. When I came to uh, Rensselia, Rensselia supported me to obtain. This is a complicated process. It's not, it doesn't happen in one shot. It's, no, it's, it's really a multi layer it's process. Hidden. So, just for those of you who are unaware, it's like the IRS. And the DMV together on steroids. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. I never heard that, but it's, uh, I think it's appropriate description. It, it's, uh, it's a very uh, serious process. It involves many steps. Uh, uh, I switched to an H visa, what they call an H visa, that allows you to work uh, in, a, in a particular place, right? And, and then from the H visa, I moved to uh, the green card situation. Through my marriage, actually, uh, through my marriage, since I was married to an American citizen, uh, when uh, we, uh, when it was time to switch from H visa to green card, uh, I, I made a petition based on my marriage to an American citizen, and it went through smoothly. Otherwise, whatever avenue would you not have had to vote? Uh, the alternative is uh, an alien of special skills. Right, that's what they call an alien of special skills, someone that has a certain qualifications that are hard to find among the population, and like are demonstrated, that are hard to find among others in the population, and then that uh, allows you to be considered for, uh, for a green card based on that criteria. But the lawyer that worked for us suggested that this process will be much smoother if you apply uh, on the basis of marriage. And he was right. Because that is going to be much easier. Yeah, so Renata, he was like, I think, alien <laughs> Alien, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the green card uh, uses the word alien. The green card is alien. Okay. All right, wow. so. <laughs> anyway, we are running out of time. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the invite.